Sounds off, doesn't it? Or is that me? Sound all right? It feels a little echoey. Is that better? That feels better. Okay. Um, good to see everybody. Uh, we'll we'll jump into our study in just a minute. We'll be in um, in First uh, Samuel uh, chapter twenty-eight. Uh, before we do, I just want to. Um, um, uh, go over prayer request and then any announcements. Um, please remember our Thursday morning Bible class. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow at 10:30. Um, so love to have anybody who can be be a part of that. Uh, and then of course our regular services. On the prayer request, um, if you remember Jody, uh, Jody Reed, uh, he's in the hospital. Uh, he's at um, the VA in Durham. And um, uh, he had to have four stents put in today, I believe. I think he told me four. He said that's a total of 17 stents. He's got like, it's like they're building a mechanical heart piece by piece. What was that old uh, Johnny Cash song talking about the Cadillac? Uh, but... Uh, uh, member Jody, if you will, he, he's hoping to go home tomorrow, but well, we'll have to wait and see. So I also remember Gary, a um, little bit of an update on him. They did do some um, bone marrow tests. Uh, it came back, no cancer, which is good, no leukemia or anything. However, there's still a big mystery uh, there with what's going on with his blood count. Uh, they don't know why, why the marrow is not producing it. So, uh, as it should, uh, I'm sure somebody with more medical knowledge could give a little more information about that, but we just need to continue to remember, pray for Gary and his health situation. I, I think there's some more testing uh, he'll obviously need to undergo. Um, any other, oh, and then also uh, Van's uh, nephew and his wife. Um, do y'all have an update on that, Adrian, uh, Cy? I think made it to the States. They made it to California and now it's kind of a, a waiting game. She has to have a doctor for me to get a referral. There's still a lot of up in the air about if they'll be able to do the surgery or not. So we still definitely need a lot of prayer. But getting over here, that, I think that step has been completed. Step so number one. They've they got a long way to go. And they're going to, uh, so for those who maybe don't know, is they have a baby who is about 23 weeks along uh, in the pregnancy, has spina bifida, and they need to go in and, and hopefully fuse that area together, deal with whatever's there. The problem is it's a very expensive surgery, um, and they only do six a year, so they're applying for an exemption for to do number seven. Number six is actually supposed to take place like this week, I think. And so um, um, we're praying for, for that family. There was one other thing I wanted to say about it. But that's John, Jonathan? Jonathan Bridget Ray. Jonathan Bridget Ray. So please pray for them and for their family, uh, for that young baby. Anyone else? All right. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, let's bow. Almighty God and Father above, we thank you so much for uh, the tremendous love and, and grace that you give to us, Father. Uh, Father, please continue to um, forgive us of our shortcomings, our sin. Father, please continue to bless us and help us, Father, in our growth. We pray that as we continue to study your word, that you'll help us to uh, better understand uh, what you have recorded for us. We pray for wisdom and understanding and, and, uh, and working through these things. Father, we're especially mindful of those on our prayer list. We pray in a special way for Jody and for Gary and for Jonathan and Bridget and, and their precious baby. And pray, Father, that you'll bless them at this time. And we pray that you'll continue to open doors to allow, um, to allow the, the surgery to continue and uh, to proceed. Uh, Father, we also are mindful of, of our um, fellowship here in Sanford. We pray that you'll bless 
uh, the brothers and sisters here. We pray that you'll continue to bless our work in this community and in our world. And pray, Father, as we approach the end of this year and we consider um, what the next year, what our plans and goals will be, we pray that, that you'll guide us through that. And that, Father, we always remember that um, that you are the ultimate uh, giver of life. And, and Father, that you have given us an opportunity to enter your kingdom and uh, to never take that for granted, but to appreciate uh, uh, your love and, and, and your grace and mercy. Father, again, uh, it's, it's such a tremendous blessing to approach you. Uh, we know that it's only through Jesus that we're able to do this. And Father, it's in his name we offer this prayer. Amen. All right, so uh, let's jump into our study. Um, we're going to uh, be in chapter 28 in just a minute. Uh, before we do, just real quickly, some of the things we, we talked about last week was we, uh, we looked at how David had another opportunity uh, to, to harm Saul, yet he chose not to do that. He showed him mercy um, and, um, and spared his life. We also discussed um, how David left that uh, area, went over to the Philistines uh, to seek out safety uh, and, and how he had to go to the enemy to find uh, safety from Saul. Uh, and then finally, we began to look at uh, uh, this portion of Saul's life when he goes to uh, search out this medium or this witch or um, whatever label you want to put there, but this, uh, this woman doing witchcraft, right? And so that's where we left off. That's where we're going to jump in tonight. Uh, we're going to, uh, to study, uh, continue that study of how he's seeking out this witch of Endor. Uh, and then we're going to proceed there to go back to David. So we're kind of switching between the two narratives. Uh, we'll go back to see what happens to David and how they uh, refuse to allow him to fight with them. Um, upon um, leaving there and returning back to Ziglag where he's been living, he will come back to find uh, that, that village or city burned and his family taken captive. And then he will respond to that, obviously. And then as we um, close out the life of Saul and close out uh, this writing, this first book of Samuel, uh, we'll see how, how um, Saul's life ends at Mount Geboa. And, and finally, we'll see how David responds to that as we begin 2 Samuel chapter 1. So... Any questions about anything so far? Thing we discussed last week. All right, let's go on to chapter 28. And we did read verse 3, but I want to go back and just start from there and move our way forward. Uh, 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. Hopefully you've had a chance to read through this narrative. Um, and so some of these verses I'll, I'll go through kind of quickly. Uh, but you can always stop me uh, if you need to ask a question. Now Samuel had died. Now we remember earlier in our study when that happened. Here the writer of 1 Samuel is, is, is reminding us of what occurred there, uh, how he had passed away. And that was important in the life of Saul and in the life of David as well. And so it was a very pivotal moment in both of their lives and their journeys. Well here he reminds us of it in verse 3. Uh, Upon his death all Israel mourned for him. Uh, and they buried him at Ramah, and I'm sure uh, they felt great regret at how they had rejected him. Now, it's interesting, the end of verse 3 notes for us something Saul did. Now, it doesn't give us exactly the time frame of this, when this occurred. Did it occur after Samuel passed, or was it prior to that? It's kind of hard to, be, um, to, to nail this down exactly, but it just mentions that Sam or Saul, um, uh, as king, had at one time put out all the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. Now, of course, that's anyone dealing in witchcraft. Uh, now, we can study the you know the, the Levitical law, uh, the Mosaic law, and understand that that was something God had forbidden was any kind of form of witchcraft, any kind of 
dark arts or sorcery. And so as a response to that, Saul did the right thing by getting rid of that stuff. Um, when you think about witchcraft, I mean, what kind of things come to your mind? What is witchcraft or necromancy? Rather than being an odd kind of sounding word. Yeah, it's, it's trying to communicate uh, with the dead. It's trying to tap into some kind of special force or magic, right? Um, you know, do we have forms of witchcraft today? You ever heard of a Ouija board, right? A Ouija board does that. Uh, it's become real popular, it seems. Uh, these ghost hunters, right? They go about doing kind of weird stuff with that. Um, you know, um, different types of astrology can be kind of witchcraftery, right? Um, and, and so... Um, you, um, popular years ago was the crystal ball, right? You look, you have these witches, quote unquote, who would look into a crystal ball and tell you your life. Well, God had forbidden that stuff and Saul put it out. Well, then you go, so Samuel's past now. Uh, Saul is confused. Um, uh, he's not quite sure what to do and then the Philistines come to attack uh, verse 5 tells us that when he saw the Philistines what was his response he was afraid right and he goes on to dare um, to give a little bit more information he says his heart trembled within him right he's not just afraid like you are uh, or maybe someone is of a mouse you know running across the floor or a snake out in the woods right yeah Right, he he, his heart trembled. Right, he was he was deeply afraid. And why do you think he was afraid? He was so fearful. Okay. And he just had that experience with David. You know, David had come into the camp and, and had a chance to kill him. And, and, you know, afterwards he admitted, you know, I'm a, I've sinned, I've done great evil, right? And so... Well, at least been told that David is the next king and that mm -hmm. the kingdom's going to be taken from him. Um, he was protected by the kingdom's going to be taken from him, so he's got to wonder about how that's going to happen. Is it going to be next king? And maybe this is the time it finally happens. He also knows God isn't with him anymore. Remember... Uh, he had earlier tried to go to God and ask for God's, uh, you know, uh, help, intervention, right? And what was God's response? He gave him no answer, right? And, and so he, he's afraid, verse 6, and he goes back to God in verse 6, and he inquired of the Lord, and the Lord did not answer, either by dreams or by Urim, or by the prof, or by prophets, right? God is just simply not communicating with him. Right? I can't help but think about Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Right? What's Isaiah the prophet telling us in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2? Verse 1 tells us God's hand is not, not short that it cannot save. His ear is not unable to hear, but, verse 2, what? Your sins have hidden him from you, right? Your, uh, because of your transgressions, he will not hear you. And, and so God is refusing to answer Saul. And, and so Saul can't go to God. Uh, he can't rely on David. He can't. Uh, he's, he's failed a few times here too. I mean, he's not got a good track record recently. And he doesn't have Samuel, right? He can't even go to Samuel. So really, uh, I guess he feels like he has nowhere to turn. And so in verse 7, he says, Seek out for me what? A woman who's a medium, a witch, if you will. Um, and, and someone tells him that in, in Endor, there is a witch there uh, that we can go to. Now, he doesn't, it's interesting, he doesn't seek out a different prophet, does he? He doesn't ask, is there another prophet of God I can go to? Uh, but, and so now he's, he's really uh, giving himself over uh, to the dark side, if you will. 
And so in verse 8, um, he, uh, interestingly enough, he disguises himself uh, and put, uh, he puts on different clothes, right? He's trying to pretend like he's someone else. Uh, and he came to the woman by night. Um, he said to, to her, divine for me by spirit and bring up uh, for me whomever I shall name to you. All right? So he wants her to bring up the dead. So we'll go through all this. I know this is kind of thought-provoking what happens here. Let's get to the end and then we'll talk about it in a little more depth. But um, verse 11, uh, the woman asks, who do you want, basically? Um, and then he says, Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now, it's interesting um, she sees uh, Samuel and knows it's Saul. Now, how did she divine, or how did she figure that out? Uh, not quite sure, but she knows now she's been tricked. But now the deed is done. Um, the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? Uh, now, it's also interesting. We're not told... Let me think how to say this. We're not told what exactly is going on. Now, you might get in your mind that she's looking in a crystal ball and she sees Samuel in the crystal ball. We're not told that, though. Uh, we're not told. Um, we're just not given everything exactly. Um, but, but it does say she sees Samuel... Uh, the king said, do not be afraid. And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, verse 14, I better move that ahead. Verse 14, what is his appearance? So obviously at this point, Saul cannot see Samuel. Right? She's, she sees something. Is it in her mind? Is it some kind of physical presence? What's going on here? Not told definitely. Um, but and so Saul, because he can't see what she's seeing, says, "What does he look like? What's his appearance?" She said, "He's an old man coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe." Um, Saul knew when he heard that that it was Samuel, and he bowed uh, with his face to the ground and paid homage. Now, before we get into their discussion in fifteen. Yeah, kind of a weird experience here, right? Now, what you doesn't seem to happen is a... F um, so if you watch a ghost catcher show, what are, you know, they, they try to capture images and sounds like that, that really occur in, in the environment, right? They're looking for some kind of physical manifestation, right? We're all physical manifestations, right? Uh, our bodies represent that there's a living being here. But when you think about the soul, though, so man is made up of two elements, right? Of the physical body and the soul. The body has physical form. It has a, it's a physical reality. What about the soul? It doesn't, right? It's incorporeal, right? We would say it, it exists in the either plane. Um, it doesn't take form. It's like the wind. Uh, you look at that uh, terminology in, in the Word of God, I think both in the Greek and in the, um, and in the Hebrew, that, that word spirit, whenever it's used, it, it it's references the idea of a breeze or a wind, right? Does wind have form? It doesn't. How do you know wind is present? You only see the, um, the effects of wind, right? Do, can you see the wind? So, if you think about it that way, um, and so a lot of these these ghost hunters and others who, who seek out that stuff. They're looking for some kind of fit. But 
Um, that's just not the way the Spirit acts, right? It's not some uh, holographic form of our, of our human form. Does that make sense? That doesn't seem to be the case to me. So um, you dig in your mind and they ask what's going on here. Now, again, I don't believe from the text is trying to indicate to us that Samuel came back in his pre, um, pre-death pre form and stood there, right? Because Saul can't see him, it's only her. Now, if this is just a vision the woman is having that she's seeing in her mind's eye, there are a lot of times in Scripture when men and women saw visions. You look at the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, it mainly consists of visions that John saw, right? Were they physical realities? No. You think about Peter. When Peter's getting ready to go to Cornelius, God, he's on that rooftop, he falls into a trance. What does he do? Well, how does God show him the message that, that now God's accepting Gentiles. What, what, how does God illustrate that? Who, who can remember that? What's that? Yes, with the picnic on it, right? Now, was that, was that in reality a, a picnic that he's partaking of? No, it's a vision he sees in his mind. It's not real. It's not... When I talk about real, I mean that it's not, not made of physical substance. It's, it's a vision the mind sees, just like a dream, right? All of us dream. Your dream's real? No. Right? And so, number one, I, I don't think uh, this is Samuel coming back in a physical way. So what is going on here? Is this really Samuel? Yes, ma'am. Um, not to answer that question, but when they, I think they, somebody brought the Lord to the Lord, and he brought Elijah, and he wanted to make mm-hmm. Is that pretty much the same, on the same line, or was it like a, almost like a physical message? All right, so I haven't studied, I have to go back and read that context to know definitely. My, my memory is, I need to go back and reread that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Visions, right? So, my, my point to all this is. Can a witch, someone performing this kind of a medium, this kind of sorcery, can they, can they recall the dead? Right? And I don't, that's not what this is teaching. I don't believe at all. Um, is, this, is this Samuel? Yes. It does seem to really indicate that what she's seeing, that is really Samuel. She's having a vision of Samuel. Now, how does God produce that? Um, There, how, what's going on? Um, Don't know everything. Now, what we can tell you is where where is Samuel prior to this event? Anybody tell me where he is? In paradise and Hades, right? Or in the Old Old Testament terminology, Sheol, right? It's, It's that realm of the dead. So that's where he is. He's at the bosom of Abraham, paradise, different labels you can put on there. And so he, um, she's seeing this vision. um, And like I said, there's not, you can't be definitive in in everything here. Um, But in some ways, she is seeing a vision of Samuel. Now, what's also fascinating is that Samuel is communicating somehow with Saul. And we'll see that in just a second. You read the rest of it. Samuel gives Saul a pretty good tongue lashing about all this. Because what he's doing is evil, and he shouldn't have done it. There's, there's also the, who, who was the, uh, uh, I should know the name, I can't think, the, the 
boy when they were surrounded and he said he prayed to God that his eyes might be open that he might see and he saw all of the yeah um, is Elijah I believe it's Elijah and he saw all the chariots of God angels in the form of chariots all around him right I I should know where that is, but I, I can't think exactly what. But I believe that's Samuel. I believe that's in the, in the Kings, uh, somewhere there. Good point. So there, there are. Well, I'm going to go down there. There are elements to our reality, things that exist beyond the physical that are in existence around us. There's no doubt about that. Uh, God exists in an ether plane, right? He exists in the spiritual plane. Um, but we're not given a whole lot of information about that, uh, as far as I can tell. However, I just want to... So, um, I don't think this is like uh, Beetlejuice where they're conjuring up somebody from the dead. It's not a right? resurrection. Yes, it's not a resurrection. It's not Lazarus. Yeah, it's not Jesus Yeah, or, or any of the men of God who've raised people from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? What she's, I believe what's being detailed here is a vision. That's my big point. So I don't believe you can go and teach here that what's going on is a resurrection of Samuel physically. So, any other questions about that or comments before I move into what Samuel says? So what Saul is doing is very sinful. He shouldn't have done this. And so him doing it doesn't give us license to participate in witchcraft. It's just the opposite. And you'll see that when Samuel yells at him. All right, so let's move on to this uh, to the section where they actually talk. I do think it's interesting. They do have a conversation. So you go down to verse 15. Uh, then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress for the Philistines are warring. Now notice what he says here. Again, I just like to point this out. Notice what he says, the pronoun he uses. A warring against me. And God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you up to tell me what I shall do. There's kind of an ironic idea here that he's going to this medium and Samuel's communicating through her and not through him, right? This even talks to the degradation of Saul at this point. That he, God didn't send a vision to Saul of Samuel. He's using this woman to do it, right? Um, so, um, he's like, I don't know where to turn. Notice Samuel's not very sympathetic though, is he? And Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? He's like, what can I do about this? You're going to the wrong place. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David because you did not obey the voice of the Lord did not carry out his fierce wrath against uh, um, Amalek therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day moreover the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines so he tells him you're going to lose this battle by the way so they're getting ready to go fight this battle. He's lost. Um, how tough would it be to go out and fight that next day? I mean, imagine if you're a college football team, your hockey team, right? And you knew you were going to lose. Wouldn't that be hard to play? And, 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 so, God, and so Samuel says, you're going to lose. Moreover, verse 19, the Lord will give Israel also into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons, now notice this, you and your sons shall be with me. So basically saying, you're dying tomorrow. It's kind of over. 
Um, the Lord will give the army of Israel and also into the hand of the Philistines. And so they're going to lose and it's going to be bad. And you're going to die. So Saul, when we get to chapter 30, he, he's been told all this already. And, um, and so he gets beat up pretty bad by Samuel. And Saul, as he does, he waits too long uh, to repent. Um, then Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. You know, I can't... There's a certain kinship in my mind to probably what's going on with Saul and what, what went on with Judas. Judas, once he had, had taken the silver and then led them to Jesus, that desperation that he must have felt, right? Saul is going through, a, in my mind, a very similar situation. He's just lost. And, and again, he could, just like Judas, he could have said, you know what, I'm, I've got to go and I've got to get before God and I've just got to lay it out. Right and beg for any kind of mercy to be given to me, um, but he's not going to do that. It says there was no strength in him, for he had not eating, eaten, uh, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And so he is just in a desperate situation. Well, uh, David on. Uh, so now the the narrative goes back to David, and David. Things aren't going so great with him either. Uh, in chapter 29, um, as we mentioned, he... Um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. That's, that's a couple chapters later, sorry. Um, no, this is it. This is it. So, he goes, uh, chapter 29, you, you, you have the Philistines. We read earlier in chapter 27 how, how the king... Um, had, had told David, you're going to be my bodyguard. That's how much he trusted David. And so they're going to war. He's called David to go to war with him. And so verse, uh, chapter 29, the Philistines gather up um, their forces at Aphek. Uh, and the Israelites uh, encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. Um, and so they're there. They're, they're preparing for battle. However, verse 2 tells us that when the other lords uh, see David, what's their reaction? Why is he here? Why is he here? That's the guy that's killed us. He's defeated us many times. Why is he here? Now, they don't attack him, um, probably because the, he has the king's approval to be there. Uh, but they, they just simply refuse to, to go to war with David. And I mean, can you blame them? It'd be a little bit of an iffy situation. And so um, the, the commanders, the, the king, uh, Achish, tries to convince them that David isn't that guy, that he's going to go and fight with us. But verse 4 tells us they were angry with the king. And they are just not going to go to war with him. They say, send him back. And um, he is not to go to battle. Uh, and then it's interesting, they quote in verse, um, verse 5 that, that song or that, uh, that poem that's been sang in, in Israel, right? Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousand. Who was, by the way, who was the killed there? Philistines, right? Yeah. And, and so they remind the king. Uh, the king in verse 9 says that to David, you, uh, you've been blameless in my sight. You know, he has no qualm with David. However, um, uh, the commanders have said he shall not go up with us to battle. And so... He's basically sent home to Ziglag where he'd been given um, a place to stay. And so verse 11, it says, He set out with his men early in the morning and returned to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. We'll talk about Jezreel in just a minute. But um, 
So David uh, goes back home. And so in this next section, you get into chapter 30, it talks about his return. Um, verse, uh, move through these kind of quickly, but um, verse 1, uh, they come to Ziglag on the third day. So it's taken them three days to travel from Aphek to, uh, back to Ziglag. However, what do they find? Well, the uh, Amalekites had made a raid against uh, the Negeb and against Ziglag. Um, and they had overcome Ziglag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And so he comes back. You can imagine how kind of just awful that scene must have been. Uh, everything's burned. I'm sure at first you're like, well, did they kill everybody too, right? And, and, uh, and become upset about that. Um, I just had this map. So here's Ziglag, just to let you know. So this is where he's encamped. He'd come down... Um, I don't think it has a map, but they had traveled back down to Ziglag and returned to find this. Now, what's the reaction of the other people? I think this is interesting. This is David's people. And, and um, what, what's going on? And maybe some of the native Ziglag people. Uh, verse 6 says that David was greatly distressed for the people were what? They had spoke of stoning him. They were ready to kill him. Uh, I'm sure David's like, I do. I didn't burn the city. Um, but because he'd taken the men away, it left them open to attack. And uh, it's really fortunate that David comes back when he did. And we'll see that in just a minute. But uh, because the people were bitter and soul each for his sons, daughters, you can at least empathize with how they feel um, losing their families and their livelihoods. But David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And notice where he turns. Right, he's in a very difficult situation. Where does he go? Where? He goes back to God, right? Um, an important lesson for Saul to learn would have been, an important lesson for us to learn. He, re he goes back to God. Verse 8, uh, he goes to God and he prays. Um, what am I to do about this? Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? What's God's answer? Pursue them. You will overtake them. And shall surely, uh, shall surely rescue. Now, one thing we can't know is what, what would have happened had David just reacted, right? Uh, we can't know if what exactly would have happened. But one thing he did by going to God, what did he do? He secured his victory because then he got direction from God exactly what to do. And he's not just reacting as just uh, as we would, you know, just going off emotion or, you know, um, anger. Uh, but he goes to God and God says, do it. Verse 11, um, they find an Egyptian uh, young man here in the open country. Uh, he's starving. Uh, he's thirsty, and they give him food and water. Uh, they bring him to David, verse 11, and do that. And then the, the young man tells David, and he's obviously a servant, or had been a servant of this raiding party. He tells David what, what happened, how they come in. Um, verse 11, it says, um, I'm sorry, verse 14, uh, they had made this raid against the Negev. Um, and then... Um, to other places which uh, belong to Judah, and then against um, against Ziglag, the end of verse 14, and how they burned it with fire. And so David then goes on to say, will you take us and show us this? The young man makes him promise that he won't give him back to the Egyptians who had done this. And of course David's going to do that. And so what do they find? Verse 16. They catch up with these guys. What do they see? They got a party going on. They thought they were victorious. Um, uh, here they're enjoying the spoils of, of, of what, what they've done. Verse 16. Um, verse 17, however, 
that quickly is ended. It says that David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who uh, mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and David rescued two, his two wives. Who's his two wives? Uh, um, what? Yeah, and uh, Ahimelech. Ahimelech. And so he, he's recovered his wife. And so David's feeling pretty victorious. Well, we have that going on there. Um, in chapter 30, verse 26 says this, when he came to Ziglag, he sent part of the spoils. Now notice what he does here. Uh, when he gets back, he's had this big victory. Now, not only had that company had his stuff, but he also had all the spoils from the other places they attacked. So David took possession of all of that. Now, what does he do with that extra? Verse 26. What friends? Ah, good political move. Right? Why is he doing that? You don't think that's going to curry some favor with the Judites who remember David? Who will remember him later on? And, and so he shares some of that with them. All right. Um, We'll just stop here because I, I don't want to get into this next section. Well, it's actually not too long. Maybe we'll go ahead and do this real quick. So that's, that's David. He, he's had this huge victory. Things are going very well for him. Saul, as we mentioned, things are not so well. Uh, they go into this battle. Uh, it says, verse 1, they were fighting against the Philistines. Um, uh, and what happened? End of verse 1. You know, if you go back to chapter 17, what is chapter 17, David defeats Goliath, and what happened after that? Do you remember? What did all the Philistines do? They fled. They ran away as fast as they could get out of there, and, they, uh, and the Israelites pursued them, right? And continued to battle them. Now you've got the exact opposite going on, in chapter 31, where now it's the Israelites who are fleeing before the Philistines. How quickly time or, uh, events change with time. And so um, they, uh, they fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboa. Uh, the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And so now you have Saul here with his main company, and they're surrounded, right? Defeat is imminent. Um, they, they at this point have already struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and uh, Malachishu, uh, the sons of Saul. So all three of his sons, Saul is there. He watches all of them die. Think about that. How defeated you would feel at that moment. And he's watching all this play out before him. Um... Just to give us an idea of where we are, here's the Valley of Jezreel. That's where they're fighting. Uh, it's in this area, and there's Gilboa. So the mountain, the mountain of Gilboa is right in this area here. Uh, that's where they're fighting. Next week, uh, we'll finish this particular uh, chapter up and then go on into um, you know, the transition over to David. Any questions or comments? Thank you so much. Go ahead and read uh, the next several chapters. Read 31 and into 2 Samuel, please. Thank you.